Well, hello, Internet, and welcome to part one of my code refactoring tutorial. I'm going to show you in this tutorial how to create great code that is easy to modify as well as understand. Now, while part one of this tutorial is going to be kind of heavy in regards to the presentation, at the end, I'll give you some code examples of some bad smells, which we're going to get into exactly what that means. And the rest of this tutorial following part one is going to be very heavy code wise. So let's get into it. So what exactly is refactoring? Well, basically, software normally fails when it becomes so complex that it can no longer provide the additional features needed while remaining error-free. Refactoring is used to improve code design to make it easier to understand and extensible or easy to extend. And if you believe a feature may be needed in the future and your current code won't easily be able to accommodate it, you refactor that code to make it easier to add that feature now rather than worrying about what you need to change with your code to add the feature later. So why should you refactor? By removing duplicate code, you remove the amount of code and hence the less code that you have, the easier it is to modify as well as understand, which I'm sure you're well aware if you've looked at huge programs and tried to understand how they work. By writing understandable code, you and others, of course, will be able to easily modify it. And by refactoring code using code you understand, you better understand the system. And this would come into play if you were given someone else's code. Very often you can look at that code and not have any idea what's going on, but if you go in and refactor it on your own, you'll completely have an understanding of how the system works. And by better understanding the system, the easier it will be to spot bugs. Refactoring also helps you write code quicker. If you write understandable code, of course, you're going to spend all of your time adding features instead of having to go back and trying to understand the past code that you have written as well as going back repetitively to fix bugs and add features and fix bugs that occur because you've added features. Refactoring also makes code easy to read, eliminates duplication, makes modification easy, and minimizes complex conditional logic. And many people think refactoring only deals with forcing design patterns into your code. This is absolutely not true. However, that is what you spend a lot of your time doing. Creating a better design is the simple goal with refactoring. And that will often lead, of course, for you to pull in design patterns and use them. However, very often you will find that you will be pulling away from design patterns during the process of refactoring. So what are bad smells? While you are refactoring code, you are doing what is called looking or searching for bad smells or, in common language, design problems. Bad design is normally just simply unclear, complicated, or duplicated. So that is what a bad smell is. So what are some examples of bad smells? Well, of course, duplicated code, which I'd mentioned before, and that duplication is either going to be very, very obvious, meaning that you're going to see the exact code over and over again, or of course it could be subtle if the duplication occurs using completely different code. Also, another bad smell is long methods. They are going to hamper your ability to share logic solutions in comparison to if those long methods were broken into many other smaller methods. And you're going to find that systems built using many small methods are also easier to understand. And in general, you should aim to have methods that are no longer than 10 lines in length or have an average length for all your methods of approximately 5 lines. Another bad smell is complex conditional statements, which I've talked about many times in the past. And of course, they're just going to limit your ability to extend a system and provide reuse. They also, of course, make it hard to understand systems over time. Primitive obsession revolves around giving up on the dynamic specialized purpose of a class by constantly using primitives over using class objects. And by primitives, of course, I mean ints and doubles and booleans and all those things, which I'm sure you know about. By moving away from the use of primitives, you're going to find that your code also is going to be clean cleaner, and more extensible. Indecent exposure occurs when methods or classes are made visible, 
when, of course, it is best to keep them private. Solution sprawl occurs when code is used to solve an issue that is sprawled across numerous classes whenever it's better to keep them all in one. Alternative classes with different interfaces occurs when interfaces of different classes are different, but the classes themselves are not different. And, of course, in that situation, it is better to refactor those two different interfaces into one. Lazy classes refer to classes that should be consolidated, and that just simply means that they don't really do much on their own, so you should move the capabilities that they have into other classes. Then we get into large classes, which can occur if you move too much of what's in a lazy class into another class. And this just simply refers to classes that have way too many responsibilities. And of course, one way to spot the large class problem is if you are using many instances of that one class over and over and over throughout your code to solve many different problems. Switch statements or if-then-else statements should also be eliminated if they make your system restrictive. And if they do, it's quite simple to go in there and replace them with an object polymorphic solution like I've talked about in the past, but which we're going to get into in great depth in this tutorial. Combinatorial explosion occurs when you use many methods to perform actions that could be done with one method that isn't as specialized. And an example of this would include creating methods for each database query rather than just creating one method that could handle numerous queries. And then finally, we come to just general oddball solutions that occur whenever you solve the same problem in many different ways. And of course, in the situation where that occurs, you need to discover the best one solution and use it while deleting all the other duplicate solutions that don't work quite so well. So that is a whole bunch of talk. So let's start getting into some bad smells and how to solve them. Now the first two problems I'm going to cover in this tutorial are going to be kind of simple to sort of ease you in. I promise you, these will get very complicated very, very quickly. Now the first thing I'm going to cover are creation problems. Now a creation method is just simply a method that creates an instance of an object. And what we're going to do here is we are going to replace constructors with creation methods. And the reason we're going to do this is normally whenever a programmer is handed a class, they have to try to figure out which constructor to call based off of parameters. And then they can get confused because, of course, because it's a general constructor that uses the same name as the class, the method name might not be descriptive enough to actually explain what's going on. And then you get into other issues with constructors where you can't have two constructors with the same number of attributes or if the types of those attributes are the same. And this is known as a attribute signature, if I refer to that in the future. That is just the list of attributes that a method would receive, or a constructor in this situation. The reason why we use creation methods is you can have descriptive names. And because you can have many creation methods, you can have different ones with the same attribute signatures. Instances are going to be created just like with constructors, and the only non-standard practice in using creation methods versus constructors is you are not going to use new with creation methods. So let's go in here and look at an example. Now throughout this tutorial, I'm going to try to use really simple code so that you completely get it. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to demonstrate the creation method replacement of constructors. And this is all based off of football team sort of things. Now if you're creating a football player, some of them might have a passer rating like a quarterback. Others might have rushing, receiving yards, total tackles, interceptions, field goals, all these different things. But a quarterback isn't normally going to punt the ball or be involved in kickoff returns and so forth and so on. So that means we're going to have to create numerous different constructors to be able to handle these guys. So let's just go in here and using the old way let's try and figure out how we're going to do it and see what problems that we would have. So we're just going to have a football constructor inside of here and let's say that we want to create a constructor that would be specific to a quarterback. So quarterback passer rating would apply and then we would have rushing yards would also apply. So we would put those into our constructor and we would go about trying to create a quarterback. 
And of course, we could just come in here, type in this with that is equal to blah, blah, blah. This rushing yards is equal to rushing yards. Okay, so everything looks fine. Now we have our quarterback constructor, and it seems to make sense because a quarterback isn't going to do return yards and so forth and so on. So now let's say we want to do another constructor that is going to be specific to just running backs. Well, passer rating wouldn't really matter with a running back. So we're just going to come in here and initialize it with just the rushing yards and so far that looks good this is for quarterbacks this is going to be for running backs so let's go in here and try to create a constructor that is going to be specific to a wide receiver well passer rating isn't going to make sense and normally rushing yards isn't going to make sense so let's say we just want to come in here and do receiving yards. So we go in here and we see some errors pop up. What is this? Well, we're hitting the problem where the attribute signature is the same here in regards to this is an int and this is an int. So this is not going to allow us to come in here and simply copy receiving yards to here and to there and then have our wide receiver create it. And that is all occurring because we have the same attribute signature for both of these. Both of them are receiving an int and nothing else. So what do we do in that situation? Well, that's where creation methods come in. So let's just come in here. And instead, what we're going to do is we are going to create a catch-all constructor. And this constructor is going to have all of these different guys inside of it. And there they are. So that is every single thing that a football player can have inside of it. And now what we need to do, of course, is to assign all of these things with this. And there we go, real simple. And now we'll create our creation methods for all of these that are going to call that constructor. So we'll just go in here and go public static football player. It's going to return a football player object. And we're going to call this create QB. And a QB is going to have a passer rating and rushing yards. Very descriptive name. We know exactly what this guy's going to do. And then what we need to do is just go return new football player and inside of this we're going to put passer rating and rushing yards and i'm just explaining there's actually the part of this that comes after is going to show you another neat way to even make this tighter but just want to explain one little part at a time and there we go now we're going to be able to create our quarterbacks using very descriptive names and we can specialize these as much as we could ever want them to and then say we go down into main and we want to create a new football player and let's say we want to create Aaron Rodgers we can just come in there and go create QB and pass in 1080 and 259 and there we go we just created our football player in a nice neat small all amount of code down here and then if we wanted to print this out with the passer rating for example we could just simply do this bounce up here of course for one second and then go public double get passer rating and return passer rating and then come back down inside of here and call for get passer rating and execute and it's going to work Aaron Rodgers passer rating and it's going to print it out so that's cool and of course we could come in here and do exactly the same things for running back or defense or whatever we would want so that is a, a very simple way to solve that bad smell so let's go in and try one more to finish off this tutorial now another problem you're going to have is you're going to want to avoid duplication inside of your constructors. And you're going to do that by chaining constructors. And the reason you want to do this is, of course, numerous different reasons. But one of the main reasons is that the more constructors you have, the more likely it is that someone's going to come along someday and will want to update one of your constructors and forget to update all of the other ones, which will cause catastrophic problems. This problem, of course, is going to be easily solved by having a few constructors that always call a general purpose constructor that's going to eliminate all the duplication in regards to assigning values to your different fields inside of your constructors. So let's jump back in and look at some more code. And you can see here is another example where I'm using football players. And each one of these is going to have a name, a college, and then I'm going to have their best 40-yard dash, number of bench presses, and their best 60-yard dash. And of course, here's just some different methods that are going to get me all of these fields up here. And you can see right here, here is a constructor that is going to create a football player, and it is going to get a name, get a college 40-yard dash, and 60-yard dash. And it's going to 
assign all those values to those fields. And then it's going to do the same thing, where it's going to receive player name, college, 40 yard dash, and in this situation, instead of 60 yard dash, it's going to get bench press reps. And you're going to see that it's again assigning player name, college, and 40 yard dash. And then down here again, you're going to see that it's assigning player name, college, 40 yard dash, bench press reps, and 60 yard dash. How can we eliminate all of the duplication in regards to assigning player names, college, and all these other different things numerous different times? The answer is, of course, chaining constructors while creating a general purpose catch-all constructor. So let's just come in here and get rid of all of this waste. And we're going to keep this guy right here. And he is going to be our catch-all. And he's going to have player name, college, 40-yard dash, 60-yard dash. And the one thing that's missing here is bench press reps. So we're going to copy this guy and throw him inside of there. And there we go. This is going to be our general purpose guy. Then all we need to do is go to this bank is equal to bench press reps. Now we have one constructor to work with. And then we just have to create constructors for the other guys. Man, might as well just copy this here. Save myself a little bit of time. So there's football player. Now the other constructor we had here did not include 60 yard dash. So we're just going to eliminate 60 yard dash from that. And then inside of this, we just need to call the constructor, the main constructor. And we can do that just by calling this. And then we're going to go player name, college, 40 yard dash, reps, bench press. And then for the one thing we don't have, we're just going to put 0.0, .0 inside of there. And there we go. And then to handle the other needed constructor, we just need to pretty much do exactly the same exact thing. Except in this situation, we're going to replace bench press reps with the 40 yard dash or the 60 yard dash, I mean. So there we are, replaced. And then in this situation, this is going to be the 60 yard dash number that is passed into it. And this guy, if he didn't do any bench press reps, we're going to have it be zero. And if we file save it, you can see down here, I created a generic guy. I'm going to execute it. And there you can see it worked. So those are two bad smells and a general overview of what I'm going to be covering in the code refactoring tutorial. Please leave any questions or comments below or anything you want me to make sure that I cover in this tutorial. Otherwise, till next time.